I come from, you know, rave culture. No lights on me, stand in the corner and play. I very much believe that identities are in flux all, all the time. I do not believe in stoic people who are always themselves. I mean, you can be always yourself, but if it doesn't change, then you're not. Because the scene was so small, there wasn't this thing about competition because none of us were going anywhere. I looked at all these old posters and press cuttings and I was like, if I didn't know this person, what would I imagine him to be like? You can do whatever. And you can be as experimental or or or, or commercial or whatever in, in your in the way you produce dance music. But if people don't dance to it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Per Martinson, welcome. Um, in some way, I could make a joke about that. I'm not sure what personality I'm talking to today. <laughs> but I, I will keep away from that for a little bit. Maybe we come back to it in a second. Um, I want to start with the PhD um, that you did for the Arctic University. Um, this was started a few years ago. Can you tell me on the outset, outset what you would, were attempting to achieve at the beginning? Yeah, well, I was, I was very much into the physicality of sound at the, at the time. Um, and I'd started looking at, there was a lot of stuff on the internet about, you know, sound and geometry, uh, how sound can alter structures in, in physical objects. And I was like, yeah, that would be kind of cool to, 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 to explore the, that, because I've always been into very loud and bass heavy music and, and the physicality of music has always been like central to what I've been doing. And, um, and I'd seen like uh, experiments in, 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 in Tokyo, getting small objects to levitate by the use of sound pressure. And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool to have, you know, people levitating when you play and stuff. Only I discovered soon that that kind of sound pressure would, kill people so it'd be kind of silly to do that but i was very much into learning and researching what sound could do with the physical world so that was the that was what i set out to do so okay so you you went along a certain path and then you talk about and i think it was probably one of your professors a woman who had, uh, had said to you um where's the personal in this, in your in your research, what did that moment mean to you, and what? How did you then change what your research was? Yeah, well, I've always been uh, working on on every everything I've been working on. It's been looking at something interesting and try and make some sound, music, art, whatever out of the fields that I that triggered something in me. So I'd never thought about looking at who I was in the whole thing. I was kind of I come from, you know, rave culture. No lights on me, stand in the corner and play. Uh, at, at least the old rave culture. So it was kind of, uh, it was very challenging to try and, and look at what, what's my role in all this. And my project was called The Search for Resonance, which for me was only about physical resonance, I guess, in the beginning. And then I started thinking, what about emotional resonance? What about the reason we scream like babies with sound to what do we want to achieve? Why do we need people to listen? And I started questioning all these things and, 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 and turning the attention into myself and like, so why am I doing this? Why have I been spending my whole life making noise? And, uh, and why, you know, why, why all this, this fuss about noise and at the Simultaneously, I, there was the 30th anniversary of my mental overdrive project. And I was uh, doing a project where I was collecting memorabilia from all, all over the years, you know, any, anything, press cuttings, photos of my friends and, and, and myself playing. And I started going backwards for the first time in my life to look at my own career and, and my own personal life. And... Um, and I started relating that to the resonance concept, but I couldn't kind of, um, I, I never, I can never stop. I want to always want to do something new with stuff. And I, I find things very boring. So the more I looked at my, my actual story, 
I was like, wouldn't it be more fun if it was all different? And I got back to um, when I was my early 20s, I left my hometown and ended up uh, in, the, in the UK. And I thought about those years and I was like, there was a lot of options. I could have done something completely different. And I started thinking, what would have happened if I'd made little choices uh, early in life? And what kind of music would I make if I had developed different sides of myself uh, in different ways than that what actually happened? So that was the kind of way I could relate the whole personal thing and my own story to what I was doing to my project. And so I did that. I went back and kind of reinvented three different versions of myself. So how did you base the three different versions? Because you've, you've, uh, one is, uh, essentially the fool. You've got fire, water and the fool, haven't you? Essentially, I think. Um, so why did you choose those and what do they represent for each of the, uh, sub, in a sense, sub personalities of you? Well, I thought everything got very complicated very quickly, and I, I needed to have something clear to work with, like a, a template or something. And and all my research about sound, geometry, and and frequency, and all this, if you start getting into that rabbit hole, you, you soon end up in everything from a research on psychedelics to uh, very ancient ideas about sound to, to uh, you know, there's so much in there and i was like i need to i need to to make it simpler in order to it for it to work and i thought what if i made very kind of um very clear and um archetypical versions of myself and i thought okay you have like an emotional side you have a very active you know or <laughs> moving forward very quickly side you have the observant side and I, I found that in some areas of mysticism western mysticism it was easy for me to use a kind of trinity uh, excuse me a kind of trinity model to see the old ideas about the yin and the yang and the the spirit that observes how these forces play out in the world so tell me about each of these um sub characters as it were so to, to start off, with, tell me about the fool, because for me, there's something of, I mean, you know, the book Fahrenheit 451, where the fireman is uh, burning books at, at the temperature of 451 um, degrees. And uh, at one point he picks up a book and he starts reading it and it changes the whole uh, of, of his life. And in a sense, the fool for me has a little bit of that in it. Tell me how you saw it. Well, I imagined myself in that story to never approach um, a career in music and never embrace my creative side so I started writing in, in my kind of fake uh, autobiography that I never left my hometown and I settled down very early in life and I had a I worked as an electrician and put a lid on everything that was creative anything inside me that wanted to come out had to be stopped and I imagined how, how would that what would that make me? And of course, this version gets a massive midlife crisis and everything just falls apart. And I thought it would be interesting to make music with that kind of outlook that I, I know nothing. I, I don't have any skills. I, I've never done anything in my life and everything is experimental. So, I, I mean, I, I shift techniques all, all, all throughout all these years. I always shift techniques in how I make music because I, I get bored and I thought it would be great to just have this mindset to anything can happen so that's what I did I started doing you know working in, on different setups and in my studio with this kind of uh, yeah the fool that knows no danger no has no no plan you just go forward and see what happens but what parts of you are in that character of the fool? Well, I guess it's that urge to always do something new, to always try and challenge what you know. And and I think that goes for, it's in it's in what you do, but it's also in life. You, you can never stop developing 
sides of yourself. So you have to kind of try and see what happens if you if you set fire to something or if you do something very unexpected. But the fool only turns into part of you when he has a crisis. Yeah, I think I think that would have if I if I, I if I were to put a lid on my creativity, or I think maybe most people, if you if you kind of keep things in, they will they will force themselves out, and I think that in that part of the story, I think um, it's kind of inevitable that the very rigid barriers he had has made uh, around his life in a very unhappy. A relationship with a with a kind of mundane reality he has to break out so if he can't do it himself when then life will break him out okay now the fire sign is the mental overdrive uh character so tell me what in that is you and what isn't you then well that's kind of very close to the bone because it's it's kind of almost um i could very easily relate to the kind of always moving forward never looking back um you know in love with speed and loud music uh, as in moving fast um and taking a lot of risks and you know a very a very active um energy in a way that just always wants to move and I, I and i've always i mean it's very close to to how i live my life very restless very i could relate very much to that but that's the only part of the project where where i pulled in something that actually existed like all the traces of what i've been doing as mental overdrive since 1990 i, I looked at all these old posters and press cuttings and i was like if i didn't know this person what would i imagine him to be like and and what does how would this music uh what kind of uh expectations would it trigger it's, uh, especially the early stuff that i put out so i was like reimagining uh that side of myself in free play with no boundaries it's hard for me to um imagine someone who reaches uh a certain age and hasn't reflected and looked back before but you say you hadn't looked back I mean I find that really difficult to accept to be honest <laughs> okay <laughs> well I, I was always I mean I, I must have looked back but I was I was always um I always had this idea that we're born with the eyes in front of our heads and that's the reason uh, there's a reason for that you have to turn your head in order to look back and it's like uh yeah you have to use your muscles uh, and I've always been very, I mean, I, I grew up in the aftermath of, of punk and new wave and, and I'm very much into the futurist ideas very early. And the whole idea about the future becoming fantastic uh, uh, has been central in my life. So, I mean, it's been, I, I'm a, I'm, I always believe that there's something fantastic is going to happen soon. And that's been a, like a driving force. I don't know if it's optimism because I'm not 100% optimistic, but it's still a driving force that soon something fantastic will happen and everything will change. Now, the neon teardrops is the, the, the water sign. Uh, the, and that is something which is really fascinating because it's also about your inner and outer identity. So tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm 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 very emotionally uh, driven as a person, but still, it's easy to forget. It's easy to it's easy to move too fast to 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 feel properly. And I, I discovered that I had become somehow uh, I don't know somehow forgotten sides of myself. And what I discovered in my musical history when I went back is that even if I been working with electronic dance music and at times uh, very hard music I was like before that I was very much into melodic synth pop and 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 all this 80s music that that 
phoned me and I was like, so so where where did all that go? When I looked back, I was like, where where what happened to all that? And I started imagining myself maybe nurturing those aspects of myself more and expressing them. And then I went on this third route to to see what would have how that could have shaped me if I was if I had focused and developed that way so that so the musical project there is kind of looking back trying to imagine what kind of music I would have made over the last 30 years if I had not chosen another path and now what I've been doing now is just kind of re recreating that story musically but it was also about um, finding a feminine side. Oh yes, definitely. So tell tell me about. The, I mean, the thing is, as a I mean, as a gay man, I think I I've have an advantage where I, in a sense, <laughs> being. I mean, you know, like uh, younger people today are very aware of of of, of mm. this, and people mm. from my generation, which is before your generation, weren't. But if you're a, a gay man, then you really are confronted with your sides and your feminine side so you have to you you look at that so how Mm. was that for you and what did you discover about yourself well i discovered that if i if i looked at myself from like a uh everything is so much about duality these days and even even the old ideas that are when i went back to the yin and the yang and the the masculine principle the feminine principle and all these like ways of the ways of sorting different uh, soul energies or whatever you want to call it and i was like uh it, there seemed to be an imbalance here there seemed to be a, you've been living your life very much expressing the active sides of yourself and sometimes not standing up for what you feel in a way and when i when i discovered that i was like that's that's very wrong i can't i can't live like that i need to I need to be a whole person. I need to have, um, I need to have support from my for my different, uh, yeah, different sides of my personality. So what I did, I, I, the first thing I did was to try and um, get a picture of myself. What 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 is my feminine side? And the early AI photo altering algorithms were out there. So I was like, okay how do I look as a woman? So I've, I've, I've dressed myself in digital drag and tried to get to know myself because the visualization is so, it's, it's so effective in a way. And that was, to me, that was such a nice way of, um, of, uh, I don't know. It, it felt like I learned something different while looking at myself in a different way. And I started following that path into, uh, so so what are your so-called, I mean, I don't believe in this, this, this polarity, duality thing. I think that that's the big problem these days. That's the big problem politically as well. I mean, we, I mean, uh, certain, certain nations have like this two party uh, politics. And uh, I'm from, I'm from a country where we're, luckily, at least we have like a rainbow of, of political parties that together work in order to to change things and and i thought the same thing would be very true about uh, being a, a modern male if that's a word i was like i need to i need to open up all my sides in order to be a full person and I, and suddenly i started looking into the the role of being male i mean i'm 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 a middle aged male uh I need to find a new way of looking at myself. And I think the, the method I ended up using was so easy to follow. It was so, it, it was very, it's very simple. And I discovered my old, um, when I grew up, I was, um, I looked at my pic, old pictures now, I was very androgynous in my appearance. And I guess I was not later in life. Uh, life happens and, I wasn't that as vain <laughs> as I used to be. So 
I don't know. It's just uh, it it was a beautiful process in 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 discovering that I had forgotten sides of myself that were that were very important to me and that should have been expressed also in the music. How has that changed you in the way that you interact with other people, or has it changed you even? I believe it has. I mean, I'm I'm I always looked at myself as a very free speaking person but I discovered that I haven't been as open as I thought I was about everything and I think I don't know there, there might be too much openness as well because uh, uh, because uh, if you if you say anything like I often do you you get into uh, you get into hurting other people uh, and I thought um, you need to express everything that's part of you but I, I found it easier to do that through the music and through the writing of these stories it was a very nice way of role playing so i could go 100 percent into the different the different personalities and see how they would uh, work musically it was very freeing to have these these uh kind of method acting uh uh, ways of making music because that's also a thing that at the time I started this project I was like okay I've been doing this for 30 years plus uh, you start getting these ideas of who you are as an artist whether you like it or not and breaking out of that I mean I always like breaking out of things but uh, breaking out of that can sometimes be difficult because you don't have like a method you don't have like uh, something that can open you up to unexpected possibilities. And I was like, if I could imagine myself being different than I've been uh, acting over the last few years, then what would happen musically? And suddenly I did stuff that I'd never done before. I mean, I find it fascinating. I, I want to come to the music in a minute, obviously, but I find it fascinating mm -hmm. in terms of the personalities. Because as you know, I, I believe that uh, music is created through the wounds of the childhood, the childhood trauma, and it connects to people through their own trauma. And um, and that's how and why uh, musicians like yourself can make such a strong connection um, to their audience, because it's an absolute on a very deep emotional level. But by developing these characters, it's almost like you're avoiding yourself. Do you see what I mean? It's mm. like you've created something um, which is fictional, generally. Um, mm. And it's that is a way of actually avoiding looking at your own, maybe your own childhood trauma, or maybe actually not that you're afraid of doing that, but maybe that you don't actually want that to be out there. <laughs> yeah, maybe I think. Well, well, now that I've kind of I've I've done my my the the the, the university project ended in uh, a year ago, and now I'm kind of stuck with 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 three different. Um, um, personas and I mean of course I am all of this and nothing is like it's it's all parts of myself and I'm writing into it uh, some truth some fiction and but I think I think you're very right about the um, this this connection thing and that's that's the resonance thing that if you, if you really if you really look at some at something very deep within yourself it will connect with other people if you if you're superficial it will also connect but not in the same way i mean i think the, re the resonance and this is what's really fascinating about uh music and sound is that the um connection to the to the other person through the sound is the medium to make that connection um and what's fascinating about your project is uh, the different journey of the sound that you are now creating from what you created before. So um, when did you first realize that sound has an impact on an audience? And, and I presume it was uh, fairly early on. Yeah, well, I, uh, I always... I always 
made noise as a child i guess not always but i, I always wanted to make 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 noise and i kind of uh, tried to play drums on anything i found and, and i started playing in bands when i was in my early teens and we played our first gigs when i was like 16 or something so the kind of the impact of an on an audience was i discovered that around that time that how, how what you did and how you expressed yourself through sound what it did with other people and um yeah i think i, I never stopped really i was like uh, I, I need to do the, more of this but but that was always like an outwards uh, movement uh, and the whole reflection part that i've been going through now is it's not i, n I never thought about it the other way around. I just wanted to make more sound. Were you brought up in a creative household? N nobody in my family uh, were playing music, but but there were music. There were record collections. I was. I think it was about three when I sat on the floor and played all these like seven inch singles of my mum's collection uh, on on her portable record deck and i remember i even remember that 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 was like i discovered something very important in my life quite early um, uh, what specifically did you discover i mean obviously you know you heard music and the, that was a, a discovery in itself but i just wondered if there was something that you can specifically hone in on and say what you discovered i guess it was just that the, the way it uh put me in, in in this emotional state i guess this kind of uh just just experiencing just being quiet experiencing getting it all in and like uh, almost meditating it, it 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 made me calm in a way i think that's the and ever since i was you know i was collecting records from then on almost no when i think i bought my first album for my own, own money when i was uh, 6 years old the, my parents were very uh, old-fashioned in the, in the extent that they didn't put much weight on a on a creative life. They always would say you need to look after money first, and not after creativity. Which, you know, my thinking is obviously completely uh, different from when I was young and I heard that and, and and went on a different path. What were your parents like, and what support did you receive in terms of actually developing? into a creative person well i was i was told that i could do anything as long as i took responsibility for my own actions but i was at the same time very rebellious and doing my own thing in spite of everything so they all i was also brought up with 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 the common sense that you need to take care of yourself you need to have a job the, both my parents were where none of us were coming from like wealthy uh, backgrounds and i think for me it was this drive maybe that's the kind of fire thing that i would have done it anyway i just did stuff i just uh i, I was in no doubt that i would do uh music and that would be my life and whoever told me otherwise were basically idiots because I knew this is what I'm going to do. That drive yeah. comes from somewhere. And I mean, you've obviously now looked into these uh, characters and parts of yourself. Have you have you sort of worked out where that drive may, may have come from? Because oft, often it does come from a childhood trauma in some way. And trauma is a very big word and it can mm. be a very small thing. Uh, well, if you can divide, uh, if you can define boredom as trauma, I guess that's. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think. Um, I mean, I had a, I had fun as a kid, but there was always, always something missing. It was like, I mean, this. I grew up. I was a child in the seventies, and I, all I remember was that everything was kind of brown or dark grey, and there was not much furniture, and there was not much going on except like one radio channel being on and I, I just found I found my childhood 
like like a really blank canvas that I needed to fill with stuff. And I, I guess that drive comes from, yeah, I guess it came from boredom, actually. You need to do stuff. You need to create stuff because it's not there already. And I, if I grew up somewhere else, I mean, I grew up in a small Arctic town. It's 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 uh, it's it's quite thriving these days with both culture and 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 everything. It's just, it, but but in, in when I grew up, it was quiet and it was dark most of the time. And I was like, okay, we have to do something about this. We have to. Uh, I have to do it myself. <laughs> When I was um, 13, I was a massive fan of David Bowie. That was in 1972 when, when Ziggy Stardust came along. And for me, he represented more than just the music because as a gay teenager, he represented a society where I felt I could fit into and be part of. When you were a teenager, where who were, the, who were these people and what did they represent for you? When I was a teen... Um... Well, my first huge discovery in music was when I was about 11 or 12 when I discovered Kraftwerk because I was so much into technology. I, I, I had all these like electronic kits lying around and building stuff and making stuff. And when I could connect that to music, that was a big thing. But that was not like a personality thing. It was more like their vision fitted my dreams. It was the whole, the future is going to be fantastic that that feeling and it's going to be much more exciting than the 70s but i think later on in life i was the music i was into was very much uh the whole joy division the cure the Pesh mode and 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 I, but i was very versatile I, I loved everything that was a bit um maybe both electronic music in 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 more uh in more challenging forms than 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 synth pop but i also liked that pop music could come in new in new dresses and and and, and that we could use the contemporary uh technology to do something that has maybe been done before but do it in new ways with new sounds so when you created, first created music, were you really fully aware about creating something new? Because in different societies, there are societies that seem to copy stuff and they go along that path. And there are societies that want to always create something new. And as a teenager at school, it's not like no one wanted to be a certain pop star. They wanted to be their own pop mm. star. Do you see the mm. difference? Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I think, I think it just felt like everything was possible. Uh, suddenly, in, in in kind of the the whole post punk thing, when when pop music suddenly was, I found interesting pop music. I found interesting experimental music. I found interesting, you know, music in any form. And I was like, this this whole field of everything being open for experimentation in some or or, or like tweaks of the old stuff. I mean, I remember hearing some of the records that I heard as as a, as a very small child were the Beach Boys, but when I heard Autobahn with Kraftwerk, I was like, "Oh wow, Beach Boys in a in a in in electronic form," you know. It's it's all I don't know. It's just it just felt like we needed to kind of recreate some of our past, but also look what could be done in the future. I think that's a, a really fantastic. Uh, um... Well, I think it's a really true thing that Beach Boys is craft work in electric, you know, um, craft work is the other Beach Boys in electronic form because Brian Wilson was such a sort of technical whiz about sound and putting together um, certain uh, vocals, which is he did to, uh, to amazing effect. And I think in that sense, it did have the relation to the to the technical um, area. When you say you were as a as a child very interested in um, I'm going to call it making things, <laughs> yeah. you know, and yeah. and cr creating uh, certain. Uh, I don't know if they, they were instruments, but you're making you're you're basically creating things that can create sound. What what was the impulse um, for doing that initially? 
it was I, I couldn't leave electronics alone so I had to kind of pick them apart to see how they worked and they never worked again uh, so I had to kind of and 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 it was also something around that time is before the before the first you know personal computers that you could also build or assemble as kits so it was you could build tone generators you could build stuff that was blinking in in, in the night and you could it was a thing it was like a hobby thing that 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 you could get into uh, in in the 70s and i think for me it clicked when i when when i understood that this can also be this can be musical instruments this is this is my future i mean one thing that you're really known for is your generosity to other artists that you're that you've um you will help out people on their journey to become a to become an artist was there anyone that helped you out yeah i guess I, i'm i mean we were we were when i played in all those early bands and stuff we were like a small group of people in Tromsø who who met at these like rock clubs and played our music to each other and also i remember also the older the older generation like i mean how how much older were they like maybe three years older <laughs> at that time he's like teenage the old guy he's 19 you know and it's like um there was also always the generosity i think because the scene was so small there wasn't this thing about competition because none of us were going anywhere we, we were not we were not looking at stardom we were just like having fun and playing music to each other so so i think that was maybe a thing in the culture that i grew up in that uh, you were were well received uh, and you were taken care of what role has uh, the nature uh, the fact that it's dark half the year um and the fact that you live in in a very northern i mean i think uh, tromsø is in the arctic circle isn't it or just on the edge yes, of the arctic circle it is. yeah it's so yeah. the what role does the nature and and where tromsø is and the distance from oslo which is enormous because people don't realize sometimes that norway is you know it's such a long uh, country so the distance from you know, like the main civilization, you're really out on your own. And, and what role does that play in the development of music in Tromsø? Well, I think when when me and my friends in 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 our teens and we started discovering all this music and importing all this music from the UK and Europe and the US, uh, mail order, um, and then when when we started combining all these like almost futurist dreams of of how the world was going to be it was very easy for us to look at tromsø as this satellite like this space station this arctic space station that just sat there in the middle of nowhere but it was still enough here that we could uh, you know be connected to the world and and observe it because i, I remember we were like when I later started traveling and, and met people from around the world, I remember, especially in the UK, people were like, what, you're into that music and that music? That's unheard of. You can't do that. You have to, do you have to be with that tribe or that tribe? And I was like, no, we, I've been sitting at the edge of the world looking at all the interesting stuff. And I do my own selection of what's interesting. But I think the nature part of it has been very central. We were like always out in nature or climbing mountains or using the, our surroundings and but i don't think we ever connected that to the more urban if you can call them that interests we had that was a different world but of course it must have it must have colored the way we think and one friend told me that most electronic norwegian electronic music has all these open spaces in it in in all these different genres from ambient to some of the new disco stuff there's a lot of open open space on top of all the more dense elements and i think maybe that's something that people outside can pick out that we, we do like open spaces because we're born in them 
one thing that you seem to have done throughout your career, which I think is really fascinating, and I don't know whether it's been a choice or it's been something that's just happened, but you sort of stayed an underground artist. How aware have you been of, in a sense, staying true to your own expression? I think maybe um, I always wanted to change what I do in order to make it keep it interesting, and I uh, and I I guess I I guess I've been also afraid of being trapped in a too successful career, if you know what I mean. Then I would have to go out there and do that over and over again, and and I couldn't do that, so. Uh, I think a combination of of wanting to keep my distance from from too much uh, pressure, but also be free to to create the music I want to. And also, I wanted I wanted to do this for a long time, and that's um, that. It's easier when you can just go on and go on. I guess. I mean, there's been other artists that have come out uh, from Norway throughout your career. But in a sense, they've all been pretty much inspired by you. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they may have gone and become a little bit bigger in terms of success, whatever that means. Um, so um, you're viewed very much as uh, the person that started it all in Norway, aren't you? You're very much the sort of uh, uh, the main focus for a lot of people uh that are come that come up in norway how how what sort of responsibility do you feel for that and also uh back to this you know generosity of spirit thing how how much does that play into your generosity well i'm i've always been happy to see people do well and do their thing um and i guess i guess i'm kind of proud of what all these all these friends of mine or like younger artists who have like come up and 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 developed and and, and just follow their own their own path I, I love the way that has been has been spreading and 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 having success whatever that is as you say um and i think um i think it's necessary to to nurture each other in that way uh, otherwise, we could just get stuck in these like loops of negativity. And, yeah, I think uh, I think people have done well. The one of the one of the projects that you've done um, along the way has been this uh, illumination, uh, chill illuminati, uh, um, and there's a surprise story about a Hollywood star who's an electronic fan. <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah 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 we when we when we we were we were on tour in the early 2000s i guess uh djing all over the world and when we played in um in actually in moscow we played at this this club in moscow we were we were we wanted to 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 have our uh to sit at the table next to the dj booth but we were told that you can't do that. It's reserved, and that was uh, actually uh, the actor Jim Carrey who had reserved the table because he wanted to sit there with his entourage, uh, and he was very much into electronic music, dance music. Did you have a discussion with him between playing and like leaning over and discussing uh, whatever? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, and I don't know why I'm surprised because sometimes I'm surprised when someone that you don't connect is then uh, uh, into electronic music, but why not? <laughs> that seems like ridiculous <laughs> for me to say that. Um, okay, I want to get back to these these characters and, and, and how the music has come out of these characters um, and how that the music has changed. So what do you see that has this project and including Pyramids on the Moon, which is a sort of autobiographical uh, um, thing that you have on Patreon that uh, you can read. And I will show you that mm. I've been reading it. Oh. <laughs> it's like a lot of pages. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and wow. um, 
that I just yeah want to know what development in the music you have seen in yourself and what changes you have seen in yourself uh, because of this. Yeah, well, I mean, um, for for the for the waveform project, which is uh, the the fool doing his experiments, that was a way for for me to to all to leave the whole idea of the club and the dance music setting, because for me, I think always, or throughout all these years, I always looked at dance music as functional. In its base, in its basis form, like you can do whatever, and you can be as experimental or, 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 or commercial or whatever in in your in the way you produce dance music. But if people don't dance to it, it doesn't work. So it's kind of functional in that way. It's a framework for it. And so I think for me to do the more uh, beatless or whatever um, floaty music or ambient or whatever has freed me from the settings that I'm usually uh, put in. And that's been very, it's been kind of a revelation to to be able to play different venues with that project and listen to music in different settings. And that's, that's been liberating in a way. The most unexpected thing was when I went back and thought, okay, what if I had continued uh, my journey of being into alternative pop music from my teens so I think what has stopped me from that before was that I always wanted to move on and everything had to be something if, if it was if it, if it worked I had to break it I had to fix it so to leave stuff alone and to be to say that yeah it's okay to make um, melodic songs and produce them and perform them and see what that becomes for me, that took a lot of, uh, and uh, not holding back, but like this, like this itch to <laughs> to destroy it, had to be uh, tamed in a way. This is the neon teardrops. That's the neon teardrops, which yeah. is, yeah, which is the project that I've been more very surprised by because I, I put it, what I did, I put out as part of my project, I put out like a seven inch single, and I faked the copyright to nineteen eighty seven, and suddenly I've found it in the alternative charts in Germany. I was like, what's going on? How, how do I deal with this? So it became something that I had, I followed it up to see where it ended up. So now I'm, I've actually, I'm releasing an album with the project in, uh, in, in September. I mean, it's much more, the, the music seems much more introspective and it's, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it sort of fits with this idea of, of, of looking back and and um sort of analyzing yourself and and um yeah more in a sense soulful i don't mean it in terms of soul music but in a more soulful um thing um how much of an effect has it had on you that this is something that is really appreciated and people have really connected to it yeah, but I'm a I'm a bit surprised, and yeah, and and maybe the the one thing that's different with that is I've never used my voice, singing voice ever, before I started experimenting with this project. Or I found I did find an old tape, uh, from from the eighties, and I was like listening to it, and and I was in a lot of like you know, bedroom studio collaborations. I was like, what was this project? Who's 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 singing on this? And I was like wow uh, that's actually me did i use my voice and so i thought uh okay that's the sound source i've never explored in my life uh it's not electronic so uh i thought okay let's try and use that as a, uh, as a thing try try and try and use vocals on on my music and i was like uh that was that was a big challenge because that was as you say suddenly everything was very personal and the human voice and expressing yourself through your voice. I mean, I can talk for hours, but using it to express something emotional through singing was very, very alien to me. It was not something that was felt natural. It had to kind of be, uh, it had to be worked on. And, and that's, that's one thing also that people seem to connect 
to music with 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 vocals in a very different way than instrumental music. And to me, that was also like a bit of a maybe I'm very nerdy, but I, I was a bit surprised that you that that you need to have a human connection in order to think music is emotional. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's always been for me. It's always been the other way around that I was surprised that you don't need <laughs> vocals, yeah. and the music could be really hard. Uh, you know, it's middle overdrive could be really could be hard, and you still make a connection, and it still touches you in some way. Um, mm. So I think mine was a sort of the uh, the other journey. The other thing, of course, and I think this is a, a reflection of of music and it depends on uh, language barriers and so on. And of course, lyrics can often trigger a, a, a connection. Now the, um, the album's called Testimony and um, it, it, is, it is a direct result of what we started to talk about at the beginning of looking at these three personalities, sort of parts of you, of what you could have been, <laughs> you know, and 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 the the mental overdraft side, and um and then your water, your the feminine, more feminine side, um, as a technique, um, do you think it's something that you can repeat, or is this an absolute one-off? I still use the the writing as this kind of imagining. Uh, I don't know where it's going to end. It's, it's it's just I've written a lot, and you <laughs> you've read it actually, and um, I think as a process I will continue to do that to see what happens and where these things could lead me, because I don't plan on what I'm writing or what kind of music I'm making. I'm I'm just we'll play it by the moment. Um, so I think I will yeah I will continue to 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 try and use the storytelling as a as a key to unlock stuff to see where where i can where it can lead me both creatively and personally it's like uh, it's a very good tool and and whatever trauma's back there it it certainly will come out i i, I know <laughs> i know this <laughs> definitely <laughs> That's going to be the great masterpiece. <laughs> Definitely going to be the most amazing masterpiece. Um, the other thing that you've connected this to, which I find really fascinating, is not only the AI version of the feminine side of yourself, uh, the writing, the autobiography, inverted commas, uh, those things, but also uh, NFTs in terms of art. Mm. So um, how does that work within the whole? Yeah, well, it's that's another thing that... Uh... As I said, I'm always curious about whatever comes up in 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 in, in possibilities in, within technology. So, when when crypto art came in on the on the side, I was like, so how can this be connected? How can I use this to express? Because there's a lot of visual work as well in there. Because I, I do take a lot of photographs and and do some 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 uh, some visual works. But they still need to be connected to the story in some way. I feel so. So, in the same way as I use some of the musical output as part of posting the texts, I use the visual uh, bits to to post uh, whatever I feel is going to. But it's very much connected to the story. It, it, it it's it's very much something I I, I I had one character also take a lot of photographs. So. So some of those are posters, posted as as uh, NFTs. One thing on that, there's a the the YouTube video of you giving your speech at uh, I presume it is at the Arctic University or at least it's for for the for them there. Um, and at the end, uh, you talk about an apology uh, mm. that you make um, to women and and um, as a just as a man, not that anything, you know, massive had happened, but just as a man mm. and that uh, the male privilege, you know, I suppose it's the white privilege is also part of the, the, mm. the thing, but it's, it's all within then and you make an apology. Can you tell me about that and why you decided to do that and what the reaction to that was after this lecture, if anyone came to you to talk about it? Well, yes, 
the whole the whole the, that that talk that I had to sum up my project, I had had some time to reflect on what I've been doing and and had some new ideas about it. And I very much my whole my personal project process, I could very much relate to the to the male role. Like, who am I as a uh, as a white male in the world today? And what legacy do I have to either get rid of or defend? And I think the whole idea about having an identity is it's I'm very, I very much believe that identities are in flux all, all the time. I do not believe in stoic people who are always themselves. I mean, you can be always yourself, but if it doesn't change, then you're not. Uh, and I think defining in these days, like politically and uh, and and just for society to def to find definitions of the changing role that I and others as a as a male uh, person uh, should develop into. I mean, we're not we we can't. There's a lot of stuff to say sorry about in the way that the world has been working. And so for me, it was important to say to to use that and take that to myself and say, I also want to take this this opportunity to say sorry for whenever I have consciously or unconsciously misused my privilege. And I will work very hard to understand what my role will be in the future. And I think that's a discussion that should be going on. Uh, I mean, this is this a job for feminism it's not really it's like uh, it's a job to for men to look at themselves and discuss what is it we're going to be what do we need to get rid of and how to adapt to a new world where everyone is equal i think that's a, a fascinating end because also if we look at young people today and the fluidity uh in their identity and how they perceive themselves is completely different to uh, your generation and completely different uh, even more to, to the generation that uh, I came from. And I think what you've done and what you've achieved with this is a sort of renewal of the old white man. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not calling you an old white man. You're, you're so young. <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's a way of mm. it's a way of renewal and it's a way of of an older generation uh being able to connect and not disconnect and you mentioned about polarity in society and one of the big polarities in society now is young versus mm. old and i think mm. it's the duty also of older people to reassess mm. themselves and to look at themselves in a way that fits in what the modern society is so, Pam mm. Martinson, I honestly, I found all your stuff absolutely fascinating, and um, I loved, you know, as a as a writer myself, I love looking at the characters and and following those and um, seeing what similarities within me or feelings within me that they that they brought out. So, congratulations! I I really think that's a that's a really great piece of work, and uh, of course, with the music, I mean, it's something that has really taken you on to another level. Um, and I think that is an, a, a massive achievement to to have done that. So I wish you all the best for your future. And uh, yeah, I'm going to see you in Tronzo again one day. Thank we're you gonna, very we're much. Gonna, we're going to have a look at your feminine side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm here. I'm, I'll be here. Okay, Pat. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews, and here is where you can connect. <laughs>